All right, everybody, I request all of you to kindly take your seats and get yourself settled so that we can begin with a further session. I believe all the speakers uh, of this particular session are ready or inside the auditorium already. So now we will be discussing and addressing uh, inequalities in South Asia through social protection policies. And to chair this session, I would like to call upon um, National N Natural Resource and Fiscal Communication, Government of Nepal, uh, Mr. Balananda Paudel here on stage. Let's give a very big round of applause and welcome him. Next, I would like to call upon Chief of the Sustainable Socio-Economic Transformation Section, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, Mr. Patrick Anderson. I would also like to invite uh, Ministry of Industry, uh, Secretary Commerce and Supplies, Government of Nepal, Dr. Baikunta Aryal here on stage. Let's give a very big round of applause and welcome him as well. Next, I would like to invite Deputy Minister, Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services, Maldives, uh, H.E. Miss Fatimath Yumna here on stage. Dr. Abdul Alim, a Regional Social Policy Advisor for South Asia, UNICEF. And lastly, Mr. Stefano, uh, Practice Manager, Social Protection and Jobs, South Asia Region, World Bank. So here we have the panelists here already on stage for the first round. I would also like to inform that before two minutes um, of time frame, you will get noticed. A green light will be shown by our friend here from the organizing committee. And as soon as your time is over, they will inform you with a red card. So I request you all to please uh, keep time in your mind and share your insight, everything on time. So with that, I would like to request um, Mr. Balananda Paudel to take over the chair and start uh, with the session. morning I think uh, we are very close to noon uh, 35 minutes uh, late uh, than our stipul stipulated uh, scheduled time uh, a warm welcome to the dignitaries uh, from governments uh, different agencies and esteemed uh, guests I am Balan on the portal a chairperson of National Natural Resource and Fiscal Commission. Uh, it is commission. That's why I uh, reiterated here. Uh, and I'm very much uh, pleased to be the part of this uh, session. Uh, the policy dialogue addressing inequalities in South Asia through social protection policy. Uh, this uh, debate uh, will explore the key trends around the debate related to poverty and inequality in the South Asian region. And it will help to explore the recent advances in measuring equalities, inequalities of opportunities. And it will uh, help, to, uh, it will provide uh, the insights uh, shared uh, in framing and furthering the debate on the importance of social protection to reduce multifaceted forms of inequalities. And this discourse will then have a role in influencing 
or providing feedback for formulation of a public uh, policy that will be uh, that will be key in leveling the playing fields uh, with this objective uh, i think uh, uh, we want to uh, move to uh, this uh, uh, dialogue uh, before we move forward uh, with the session i would like to introduce our esteemed uh, panelist uh, we have uh, actually we have uh, five panelists and uh, i think uh, the time is uh, very much limited so uh, 10 minutes time uh, will be available so we have uh, patrick anderson uh, he's the chief of the sustainable uh, socio economic transformation section Section Social Development Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, even SCAP. Uh, he has worked with the SCAP in Bangkok since early 2011 and is responsible for inequality and social protection issues over the past 25 years. Uh, Mr. Anderson has worked extensively on a wide range of social development areas as well as labor market issues. And we have Dr. Baikunta Aryal, Secretary, Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Supplies, uh, Government of Nepal, has been with the Government of Nepal since January 1990, before assuming the office of Secretary uh, at the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Supplies. He was the Secretary at the National Natural Resource and Fiscal Commission. We have privileged working together. Uh, in addition to his official responsibilities, he has keen interest in the area of macroeconomics and resource economics. And we have uh, Honorable Deputy Minister Fatima Huma. I pronounce correctly or not? Please. <laughs> uh, she's the um, Minister of, uh, Deputy Minister of Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services all the way from Maldives. And we have uh, Dr. Abdul Alim. Uh, he is the regional advisor for social policy covering South Asia for UNICEF and is based in Kathmandu. For the last 20 years, he has worked with UNICEF in the developing world, covering countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Commonwealth of Independent States and the Middle East. His major interest is in the application of regional-based management and human rights-based uh, approach to reform social policy and planning with an emphasis on social service delivery. He is a member of the UN Development Policy Network. And lastly, we have Mr. Stefano Patronostro. I pronounce correctly. Is the World Bank's uh, practice manager of social protection and jobs global practice in the South Asia region. In this role, he oversees the World Bank's work on social safety nets, social insurance, labor market, and job creation policies in the region. Previously, he was practice manager for the Asia region and lead economist in the Middle East and North Africa region. Dr. Paternostro's extensive experience in publications cover issues related to fiscal and redistribution policies, social protection, education, poverty, and labor markets. As we move on to our discussion, I would like to give a gentle nod to our dear panelists that although the discourse on addressing inequalities can stretch to time infinite, given our time constraints, We'll have to conclude our views within 10 minutes each. Before two minutes, you will be signaled. Uh, we'll have a separate uh, Q&A round after the deliberation finishes. Without taking much of your time, uh, I would like to invite, uh, firstly, I would like to invite uh, on the floor, on the dais, Mr. Patrick Anderson. He will be presenting on the situation of social protection in the Asia Pacific measuring inequalities of opportunities and identify the furthest behind. Please.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to give a presentation at the, this dialogue number one. Um, I'm Swedish, and I'm quite often um, asked, what's the secret behind social protection in the Scandinavian countries? Um, I'm not going to reveal that secret, because then it's not a secret anymore, but in my view, there's four critical dimensions to build a sustainable social protection scheme. First of all, you need political commitment. You need long-term agreements across political parties and key stakeholders to agree on investing in people and in systems and in uh, institutions. Second, you need public acceptance to solidarily fund schemes mainly by increasing taxes and particularly on income, capital and on wealth. Thirdly, you need competent and trusted institutions that deliver on their commitments. And these institutions should also be held accountable for wrongdoings. Um, coming back to, to being a Swede, um, the most popular when they do the polls and they do the service of authorities in Sweden. The most popular institution is the tax authority in Sweden, which collects among the highest taxes in the world. And the much lower popular institution is the social insurance office that hands out the benefits. So it's, it's not so much what you do, it's how you do things. Um, finally, I think you need time. You don't build, design, organize, and implement, and monitor a new social protection system in a couple of years, it takes time. I'm not saying it takes as long as is done in Europe or in, in, in Scandinavian countries where some of the schemes have been developed over 100 years, but it does take more than a year. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, starting with a chart showing uh, uh, public spending on social protection as share of GDP. Um, and I relate this to uh, political commitment. You see the red line that goes through the, um, the chart. That's the average spending in Asia Pacific. It's 3.7%. Nepal is, is uh, marked there with 2%. The global value is slightly above 11%. That includes Latin America and Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa and everything. The OECD EU average is around 20 to 25% of GDP. So, it matters how much you spend. Second, in terms of public support, you need to collect taxes. And this chart shows the total tax revenue as share of, of GDP. Um, I haven't included the, the Scandinavian countries there because it ruins the, the scale, but <laughs> there are around 50-55% of GDP is collected from taxes. The OECD average is 35%, Asia Pacific is 20 and in Nepal is around 15%. The red dots you see on the chart shows the share of the total tax revenue that comes from um, income profits, capital gains, wealth, etc. In Asia Pacific region, that is about, um, or let me rephrase, the VAT in the uh, OECD countries is around one-fifth of the total tax revenue. In Asia Pacific, the VAT is around half of the total tax revenue. And as we know, value-added taxes and taxes on consumptions are always, often uh, regressive. In terms of time, <clears throat> Asia Pacific has less than what Europe had. And there is a risk that uh, many countries in Asia Pacific will, will um, get old before they get rich, which is the opposite to um, many European countries where it took around 100 years to, to become an old uh, nation. Um, by 2050, one quarter of the population in Asia Pacific will be above 65 years old. So what's the result in Asia Pacific? Well, first of all, there's 400 million people living in extreme poverty. That's one, below $1.9 a day. There's another 800 million people living in, in moderate poverty, which is be, between $1.9 and $3.2 a day. 1.5 billion people 
have no access to improved sanitation, 1 billion workers work in informal or vulnerable employment, and 60% of the population has no access to any social protection whatsoever. So this situation is not only a result of low coverage of social protection benefits, but it's also a result of unequal access to basic fundamental services. So we need to understand the inequality of opportunities and where these inequalities are high or low. To do so, we have two basic assumptions. The first one is that access to fundamental services or opportunities should be universal. The second one is that individual circumstances or characteristics, such as being a man or a woman, being, living in a rural area or in, in an urban area, should not impact the access. In our work of inequality of opportunity, we use services and opportunities that are closely linked to the SDGs. And we have divided them in, on the individual level and the household level. And the data we're using, which I'm going to show you now, is from DHS and MIX surveys. So on the individual level, we have education, malnutrition, women's health, and full-time employment, which actually comes from the Gallup survey. On the household-based um, uh, opportunities, we look at safe drinking water, basic sanitations, clean energy, ownership of a bank account, and also of a mobile phone. <clears throat> we use a combination of um, circumstances and characteristics. Um, that may impact the level of access. These are the wealth. We look at the, the, the wealth distributions, the bottom 40 versus the top 60, uh, age groups, residence, as I said, minority status, religion, ethnicity, language, education, gender, etc. So to measure the inequality of opportunity, we use something we call the dissimilarity index or the D index. Um, in short, I'm not going to go through the equations, but in short, it's, it's similar like the Gini coefficient. It varies from zero to one. Zero is, uh, in some way, it's, it's good. It's, uh, it's everyone has equal access, while one, it sits with um, one population group. So the difference between the, the, the Gini in, in definition and this D index is that here we look at population groups with shared characteristics while the Gini coefficient looks at the distribution of individuals. So if we look at the average for the whole Asia Pacific region, the 22 countries I think for which we have data, we see that the clean fuels and higher education but also full-time employment has the highest inequality of opportunities. While drinking water and electricity and modern contraception is doing much better. Or, yeah, I will come back to that. Um, Looking at the D index by country, it's here grouped by sub-regions. Um, I notice when you talk about regions, you mean South Asia. When I talk about regions, I'm talking about the whole Asia Pacific of 4.3 billion people. So anyway, the, the brown or the maybe orange, the brown over here, the top uh, five, six countries is South Asia. And uh, I've marked out um, Nepal there. And you see Nepal is, is, is relatively less unequal than, except for Maldives, most of the other South Asian nations. However, Central Asia, one of the red ones on the bottom, is the most uh, equal uh, countries in the different sub-regions. Um, and the reason is not that they're, they're richer, the reason is that there's a historical reason to it, to, to uh, distribute and allocate resources more evenly. I should, I should also say that having a low inequality of opportunity doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has access and the situation is good. The inequality, the size of it, is more a con shows the concentration of inequality. So if one or two population groups with shared characteristics are excluded or, have, or might have access while the other ones have not, then you get a higher D-index. If we look at Nepal, um, the most unequal opportunities there or, or uh, services is full-time employment and clean fuels. They stand out quite remarkably. While drinking water and electricity and basic sanitation is, is more evenly distributed. Um, 
the United Nations Sustainable Development Group uh, developed an operational guide for leaving no one behind some time ago. I believe this, this, this methodology is now rolled out in, in Nepal, which is one, I think, of the pilot countries. Um, anyway, the step one of this five-step methodology says that we should identify <coughs> those who are left behind, understand who they are. So how do we do this? Well, again, by using the DHS and the mixed surveys, we have a statistical model we call a classification tree. Um, simply put, this is an, uh, you look at one opportunity, you look at the average access, and then there's an algorithm that splits the samples into, um, the red flag is up, splits the samples into significant differences. Okay, I speed up. Um, taking the example of clean fuels in Nepal, for example, the average access is 35%. The first significant split comes at the wealth distribution, the top 60 versus the bottom 40. The top 60 then splits into rural and urban, and then the urban splits into higher and lower education, while the bottom 40 splits into urban and rural, but it's almost the same here. So this one, there's a combination of all the characteristics of individuals and we find that the richer urban households with a higher education has, has an average access rate of 80% to clean fuels, while the, the poorer, to a certain extent, rural households have an access rate of 1.5%. There's a gap of almost 80 percentage points. Um, I will skip this one, but this one is, we're doing it for all countries and then you can compare the the highest with the lowest, the furthest behind, the furthest ahead, and the middle bar is the average access in the country. But due to time, I will move on to show you another example on, from a Nepal, which is the access to professional help at childbirth. Here we're starting at some 68%. The split here comes at um, education. It's secondary or higher education or lower education. And again, going through the tree, we identify that the furthest behind in terms of access to uh, professional help at childbirth is poorer households with no education. They have an access rate of 36% compared to richer households with higher education who has an access rate of 94%. Again, we can compare across countries, but uh, time has run out for me. Um, I will skip this one as well, which is just the bank account. Um, you can look at, if you just look at the lowest two red, li red lines there, you see that the, the lower education and the secondary or higher education makes it quite big. It almost doubles the access to a bank account in Nepal. Um, I'm summing up. Um, so to conclude, um, scaling up investments in people through social protection, but also through increasing access to basic and fundamental services we need to know where the inequalities are the highest. And we need to know the access rates where they are low. And we need to identify the furthest behind. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Baikunta Arial. Is my presentation uploaded or not? Usaji? Is it uploaded? <laughs> yeah, it's there. Okay, thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me speak a brief about how inequality is being addressed by the social protection measures in Nepal. As I understand, in the previous session, the Honorable Finance Minister and Honorable Member of National Planning Commission have already spoken about what's being done and what is going on in Nepal. So I think I have very little things to talk about in here. Nevertheless, I just uh, share some of my thoughts over here. Inequality, as Patrick also mentioned, is a multi-dimensional dimensional phenomenon. Earlier, we used to call about only the income inequality. Now, in the every aspect of the social life and human life and economic life even, we have the 
different type of dimensions for the measuring the inequality. What uh, I'm going to talk about in the whole session today is one is the inequality of outcomes, how it is in the economic and social terms, and inequalities of opportunities, whether we are investing enough to develop the capabilities and whether we are doing enough for the accessibility. Without the accessibility and without the capabilities, even if the government spends a lot of resources over there, the inequality might not be reduced or might not be, I mean, the, of course, it cannot be eliminated wholly, but again, it cannot be reduced. That's what I'm talking about. And then more specifically, dimensions are there on the education and health and standard of living that I'm not going to talk about more because this is the normal and standard dimensions for the MPI, multidimensional poverty index and multidimensional inequality index and all these things. And uh, as uh, we have the privilege to have chair of national Natural Resources and Fiscal Commission. It has also identified some of the criteria to assess the disparity among different chairs of the government here. That again, I mean, they talks about somehow, they talks about the inequalities. And that they have six dimensions and 29 areas of six dimensions. And the economic front, they have nine areas. In the education front, six areas. In the health, two. And demographically, it's five quality of life for and climate change vulnerability because our country is always in the vulnerable position for the climate change. So climate change vulnerability three. So altogether 29 areas they have identified to assess the inequality among the local governments and among the provincial governments. Crux of an NNRC criteria is that special inequality matters for resource allocation. And as you, uh, allocate the resources. As you derive the formula for resource allocation from the center to province and local, then the special inequality should have to be addressed. That's what the crux is. Uh, let me just talk about the very briefly about the Gini in Nepal. It's a bit volatile in nature. It was 0 0.35, its index. Uh, in 1995, when we conducted first analysis, Nepal Living Standards Survey, and it went up very sharply to 0.43 in 2003. The reason was we had the somehow internal conflict over here, armed conflict, and some kind of unrest was going on, and it was escalated at that time. And then in 2010, when we had the third round of analysis, National Le Nepal Living Standards Survey, the inequality again went down, and it's 0.33 now. And we haven't done any analysis after that, and we are aiming to do it in next year. I mean, this fiscal year, that means 2019-20. And you can just see in the graph over there, it has a kind of conic type of uh, pattern that it gives. It was a bit low, and then again it went up, and it is moderate now. And the constitution is very clear and very strong on reducing all kind of inequalities in the country. So the social protection now, what we are going, what we are doing. Two dimensions that we are talking about. One is the social insurance, that is either contributory or savings based. And for the some, some uh, formal sector uh, people over there, some, some kind of contributory scheme is there, and some in some is area, saving based is also there. And another one, the government is contributing for the social assistance, that's purely tax financed. And some other more areas are also there. One is the labor market intervention, how we are intervening in the labor market, and micro and targeted schemes are there, and again, the child protection schemes are over there. And the social ins insurance, this is purely the risk mitigation measure, as everyone knows. And some interventions are there, Number one is the, we had enacted one very powerful law, that is Social Security Act 2018, and it integrates all the approaches for social security provisions. We had, I mean, the, all the scattered social security schemes, social protection schemes and everything. So we tried to integrate all those things through this act, and contributed, contributory type of social security is also there, one, the pensions for the civil servants and the formal sector levels. And another one, we also have one social security fund. That is for the 
uh, contributory type of social security schemes for all the labor and whoever uh, work in the in the country in the formal or informal sector and the product insurance is also there that is mostly for the micro and smallholder agriculture products for the social assistance that is through tax financed supporting most vulnerable groups that is the aim of the social assistance and some interventions are there as you know we had uh, uh, began the social security schemes in 1995 and as Patrick was mentioning about the secret of uh, the social protection in Scandinavian country and it's not uh, that secret because I was also uh, one of the graduates from one of the Scandinavian countries so <laughs> I knew that one and uh, we started in 1995 and it had been scaling up every year so the um, amount has risen uh, reasonably and it is the direct uh, cash support and welfare and social services that is targeted to the differently able people and for the uh, we have different type of category for those things and then again we provide the cash, uh, cash to them and temporary subsidies subsidies are there at the time of disasters external shocks and everything we have that kind of provisions and if you remember exactly four years ago we had massive uh, earthquake over here and we had a lot of uh, subsidy program at that time and public sector pensions that's not for the vulnerable groups but uh, for the civil servants and all those things that is the social assistance and that until now, um, for my, myself, uh, even if I can give one example. Myself, I'm the public pension holder now. I, I mean, I'm the public servant, and when I get retired, then I'll get the pension. And that is through the tax finance. That is social assistance, not through my contribution or anything. And other areas, labor market intervention. Uh, that we have two type of uh, market labor market programs. One, to address the active labor markets and another ones to passive labor market for the active labor market we have uh, created some jobs in the public works and we have a very famous program that was launched last year and it gave some positive results too that is prime minister employment program and SMEs we are I mean they're developing them throughout the country and youth self employment program was there and it's still there which uh, enables the youth to access the finance and get the skills and everything and rural self-reliance program is also over there who through which the um, uh, rural people will get some kind of subsidies and some kind of grants over there and skills development are the um, for the direct employment and passive labor, labor market programs are also over there that is the minimum ga employment guarantee schemes through the employment guarantee act that we have enacted um, one year ago and unemployment support is also over there and some micro and targeted schemes are there. One is the targeting the small holders. That is for the agriculture. This is insurance schemes are there. Subsidies are there. Uh, agriculture subsidy on the finance. We have the micro credit programs, deprived sector lending program, agriculture credit, and on the education. There are several scholarship programs, midday meals, free textbook, free education up to secondary level is also available. And in the health, cash support for poor to treat some typical illness, free primary health services, universal health service, in service uh, I mean the health incidents are there. Just one minute, sorry for that one. And for the women also, some targeted programs are there. And one very specific program is President Women is Uplifting Program. And senior citizens, cash transfer and transfer subsidies are available for the ch child, children, early childhood development is massively carried out. And vaccination, and I missed one, multi-sectoral nutrition program is also over there. And the poverty card is the, for the distributed for the identified poor. So just I wanted to show this data and then I'll leave. Uh, social protection expenses, how much we are spending on the social protection. I slightly differ with Patrick over here. Our social protection expenses is 3% of GDP. Uh, I mean, the, if you just talk about only the cash transfer, it's cash transfer alone is 1.1%, uh, which was uh, in 2016, it was 16, 17, it was 1.4% and 1.3% in 17, 18. And for this particular year, for this fiscal year 2019-20, the social protection expenses is 1.8 percent. That is the, I mean, the if, if you go through the budget uh, allocation table and everything. But there are several other programs which are sectoral ministries, which sectoral ministries, I mean, the 
carry out and if you add up to that one and then it's three percent so it's a bit difficult to ca uh, add up but again we have the data so it's three percent that i can claim so this is the uh, the graph over there it shows that the social security as a percentage of gdp it's going up and up and one final thing about the because the chair is already here and uh, it's unfair to talk about what they are doing in here where to, to reduce the inequality in the spa I mean the special term. Federalism is there and then NRFC formula is derived such that I mean the, it addresses the socioeconomic disparity among provincial and local level and disparity in index that they have I mean the constructed it contributes 15 percent for provincial level and five percent for local level in transferring fiscal equalization grants so i mean this also uh, tries to reduce the inequality among different tiers of the government so i mean the this policy issues always the debate i believe the finance minister has also mentioned about this universal universal universalism versus targeting is always a problem whether social security is cost effective or not how to balance between them targeting income and capabilities whether misrepresentation we just allow or qualities should be taken up and dualism how to take on up okay go, government can just do for the formal sector what about the non-formal sector non-formal players how, how can do they be brought into the frame and the role of the government is always the problem so this is the concluding uh, slide one only one uh, point that I just would like to uh, raise over there. The third one on the challenge, this targeting problem. Uh, some years ago, we had carried out one uh, very quick study, and it found that, I mean, there was a lot of exclusion and in inclusion error while, we, uh, while distributing this social security uh, allowances and everything. So to minimize all this exclusion and, and inclusion error, we have a lot of data constraints and how to address those data, con data constraints is always the challenge. And then only uh, after, after getting the uh, good data, after analyzing them, and then if we implement this type of social progression program, then it would be effective. That's the thing. Okay, thank you. Sorry for taking some long time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ariel. Uh, now, moving ahead, I would like to invite uh, Deputy Minister Fatima Humana. Uh, she will be talking about uh, social protection in the Maldives, opportunities and challenges. Please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I will try to stick uh, for these 10 minutes which is given. Um, uh, it's good to be here. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to at least uh, highlight the social protection sector in the Maldives and what we are doing uh, in order to address uh, the issues that we have. As you know, that uh, Maldives is very famous for tourism, white sandy beaches, and it's known as the paradise. And we are represented as a tiny dot in the world map. But the issues and problems that we have are quite similar in the region and international as well. So just to give a <clears throat> brief idea on the demographic of Maldives, we have reached over 515,000 population, half of which is uh, f uh, women. And um, uh, we do have, uh, like, uh, we are just starting on addressing some issues. We do have social protection programs, and how we are trying to tackle the other issues is also, uh, like, uh, we, we, we are trying. Uh, the current government was um, mm, elected in last year's November. So with that, we, we do have a lot of issues that we need to address and see how effectively we can address uh, these uh, uh, issues like economic and social protection and other issues that each of our countries are dealing with. Well, um, with that note, I want to say that uh, Maldives do have a huge potential, but it's yet to be realized. And also, we, are, we, we know that investing on uh, these potential is to invest on social outcomes. And also, that what we are trying now is the bigger picture is to come up with a national uh, development plan, which I am also part of it. And from where I am coming from the social sector, we try to address, include 
every aspect that is related to women, uh, vulnerable groups, and other, other sectors, so that it is included in the National Development Plan, along with the Strategic, National, uh, strategic Action Plan. So there are um, uh, three major components, family perspective, social protection perspective, gender perspective, which we have got it in place in the strategic action plan of the country. And also, uh, there is, uh, since, uh, like, uh, we are not from a landlocked country, we have, like, our over 1,100 islands, and uh, transportation is a huge issue, accessibility is a huge issue, uh, but we, um, we are trying to get a really good spatial planning along with the National Development Plan and this action so that uh, the uh, services along with what we are trying to address here can be reached to the most needy and where nobody is left behind that concept. So we are bounded with uh, international commitments, CEDO, CRC. So we, 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 we have to work along with the national laws and acts that we have in order to address uh, the, the, these, thing, these issues. So what um, the social protection, like uh, we consider it's not only uh, like the financial values, the services that comes in is also very important in order to address and also uh, with that, with this, I want to say, like uh, during the <clears throat> opening, the finance minister said, like Maldives cannot be considered as some, uh, like uh, along with the other countries in the region because we import everything. We have resources, fish, yes, tourism, but everything, including labor, we, we have to import. We do not have technical capacities. Uh, like uh, so the, the technical experts and everything we, we, we do have to import. Uh, social protection in our constitution is recognized as a right. So with the mandate that we are given for the Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services, we have to do social, we are into social welfare, we are into social protection, we are into uh, national drug uh, related issues and agencies addressing on, on those aspects and also we are, we are the provider of uh, um, cash assistance under National Social Protection Agency. So we have a broad mandate but then uh, there are some programs like universal health coverage, education is covered, but uh, likewise uh, we do have uh, assistance on foster parent, uh, single parent, and uh, also um, disabled, uh, persons with disabilities, we do give some assistance. But there are like some issues that we still feel that it is not reflected in the system, in the scheme like the vulnerable population, it's not only persons with disabilities or children or elderly, but those that are suffering from vulnerable or these kind of situa situations like violence against women or violence itself, those who are in need, uh, the social insurance scheme or the social assistance scheme needs to be incorporated uh, in l these kind of uh, you know, aspects needs to be incorporated, which we are trying and we have reflected in the strategic action plan of ours as well. We do have a gender equality law. We do have a social protection act. We do have a domestic violence act. We do have sexual harassment act. There are laws, very good laws, but the implementation part is very low, very slow. So um, um, we, we, we do try to address this. We do try to raise uh, awareness, sensitize the other sectors as well, so that, that ca these, these, ca these uh, uh, sensitizations and uh, programs that we do run within the sectors, within public, private sectors, can be incorporated and included in the development itself. So, uh, likewise, we, we, we also realized that we, during the process of uh, reviewing these things, um, the documents and uh, uh, aspects, the, there is no real def definition of social protection. I'm sure that uh, this opportunity that I'm being given and the uh, ideas and discussions that we get, we, we will be able to come up with some, some ideas on how the social protection itself can be defined. A lack of profession and uh, technical capacity, I already highlighted. And there's uh, like uh, 
providing social services, we do have uh, shelters or rehabilitation, but it's not enough since uh, the, uh, the service composition is all, all concentrated in the capital Male, which is really congested and one of the highly dense populated city of the world. So we are trying to uh, decentralize the services and see how effective with the uh, right uh, um, convenient transport mechanism can address these issues. We do not want to concentrate only in capital Male and develop and uh, it's creating a lot of issues as well. So <clears throat> likewise, we also have uh, delivering quality healthcare we do have universal um, uh, coverage, we, but there are, we also need to ensure uh, quality and equitable education as well. Recently, we started um, giving uh, free education until degree, uh, first degree. So this is one achievement uh, which we, we uh, those who were seeking higher education and not being able to get financial support or any support, uh, th now this has been covered and we, we are able to uh, work on this and trying to improve with education and higher education ministry in order to address the issues that, will co that are coming uh, while opening this uh, opportunity. Providing inclusive, affordable, and adjust, uh, equitable, uh, adequate housing is one of the issues we have. Oh, and um, ensuring inclusive development is also one. So we, what we have tried is we, uh, the employment issue, the unemplo uh, unemployment of persons with disability or giving them opportunity, uh, getting everybody on board in order to achieve the inclusive development and sustainable development goals and also ultimately which will uplift their life and uplift their, uh, mm, uh, mo they motivate them, motivate our people, community, is uh, one uh, thing that we are also trying to work it out. Uh, so just to touch uh, some of the challenges, um, the transport, accessibility, uh, of not knowing. We have found out that uh, even though we have these uh, schemes and social protection mechanisms, the accessibility to information is a, is a challenge and uh, we are still trying to work it out on how effective that uh, in the islands uh, these services can be accessed and how uh, they can utilize this. Digital governance can be improved. We feel that ICT and technology can be a really good uh, aspect on providing an efficient, e pro efficient, effective social protect protection mechanism. Uh, we are a very technology, uh, I would say we know, and we are, um, we are aware of it. Uh, that we can, I can say that the Central Bank of Maldives, this banking application is used by 43% of the population. But uh, how it is used, how th these kind of um, mechanisms, uh, we need to uh, work it out. And um, the results of poverty and inequality, we recently had the household uh, income and survey expenditure, expenditure survey, which shows that uh, measuring poverty, like food expenditure, non-food, durable expenditures, and these things, it is not equally distributed. Uh, we might be known as the, hi the highest D GDP uh, country among the region, uh, but uh, within the uh, uh, Maldives, from the capital to the atolls, it really shows a fluctuation, a big fluctuation. Poverty is also the same. Equal distribution is an uh, issue that we need to highlight, and we are trying to see how uh, the unemployment issues, how youth empowerment, and all these uh, can be uh, uh, brought in one platform and see how uh, effective mechanism can be brought uh, out of it. Uh, who are poor in the Maldives? Household and individual demographics, like I said, it, it shows that we are very well off, but then equal, equal distribution, and uh, I am sure that we can see, uh, uh, everybody has mobile phone, everybody has these latest uh, gadgets and things, but still we, 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 we feel that they, it should be addressed. One minute. <laughs> 
And um, the sustainable development, uh, yes, it, it, should, it comes with inclusive, uh, uh, inclusivity of everybody who are on board. So um, I would say that um, with this platform that I am being given and the opportunity that I am being given, I can get some good uh, knowledge and experience from whoever is going to talk from uh, this morning and again not next two days. Uh, this opportunity that I am being given will be really helpful for me to even uh, work on the programs and projects that we are working on addressing the social protection uh, issue within the region and uh, how this can be um, coordinated well within our system and the region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Abdul Alim. He will be presenting on uh, inequalities in budget policy. Are policymakers doing enough? Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, where is the card person? Can I see the card person? Uh, okay, good. Um, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of observations before I start. Um, this morning when I heard the finance minister of Nepal, I must say I was quite impressed and it's very difficult to um, you know, go beyond his speech. He has touched almost everything that, that we could have said this morning. Um, one of the things that struck me was his point about political resistance to change and I think that's a very, very important point that he made. Um, when you listen to these presentations, you have a lot of data thrown at you and people are sometimes get exhausted with data. The issue sometimes is we know a lot of things. We know that lots of things are uh, known and measured. The question is what does what brings political change and policy change? And I think that's the critical question we need to understand. Over the coffee break, I was talking to a colleague and we talked about what is so different about South Asia that leads to still very low human development indices across all the countries in South Asia. Despite a lot of debate going on on uh, data and improving budgets, we still have uh, one of the lowest human development indices in the, in the world among the regions. And so the question is, what is not happening in South Asia? And uh, I think that part of the answer could be to understand what is really happening at the household level, and I'm going to focus some of my presentation today on that. Uh, we know that there is increasing information on income inequality, gender inequality, and multidimensional uh, inequality in South Asia, and some of that has been integrated in budgetary process. But I think that um, one of the and but the gaps are still not closing. And I must say that uh, recent data from India and Pakistan still shows that inequality is rising. While India has lifted a lot of people out of poverty, inequality is still an issue. Uh, we also have heard and we will keep hearing in the couple of days a huge amount of data on return of investment on early education. Uh, what is now coming out also uh, on recent data from 2016-17 uh, onwards is a huge amount of uh, information on psychosocial deprivation. And I don't think that we do, we do enough on understanding what is psychosocial deprivation. Uh, there was a study by CDC um, in, 2000, uh, in late 2000s which talked about uh, uh, a measure called acute, uh, adverse childhood events. And they found out that if you score eight or 10 on those events in your childhood, it is likely, you are likely to 40 to 50% more likely to develop uh, heart disease or, uh, or, or uh, hemorrhage in your old, uh, in your middle or adult, adult age. So there's also a huge amount of what you call productivity losses that can happen if you have psychosocial deprivation in an early age. That again builds the case for early investment in childhood. Uh, what still I think is, is, uh, uh, needs to be addressed is inequalities within the household and also um, uh, you know, uh, most of the limitation is that surveys usually give us household data but don't give us enough information on what is really happening in the household. And so part of my presentation is directed towards understanding that. But before I go on to that, I must also say that my four or five years of work in South Asia as uh, I've learned that a uh, lot of national budgets are still out of sync with age, uh, age classified deprivations. So if you look at in, uh, in South Asia, and I'll show you a slide, uh, highest poverty is still among children um, and investments are still not going in those age groups. Um, you know, the finance minister spoke and we know that investments in social protection can really, uh, you know, build social capital and also enhance social contract, which is a key to looking at uh, uh, tax to GDP ratios in South Asia, which are one of the lowest in the world. 
Um, so we'll move on to um, some quick results from the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index that was released in September uh, um, last year, uh, actually June this year. Uh, and you see that most of the children, poor children, 85% of the poor children actually live in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So South Asia has this distinction of hosting one of the largest populations of children um, who are uh, multidimensionally poor. Um, what do we do to understand what are the household, intra-household dynamics on poverty? Uh, we restrict the sample to children, uh, look at deprived children, what is the percentage, girls and boys, uh, who are MPI poor versus non-poor within the same household, and also what are the other household deprivations that poor children experience in the, in the household. And this is uh, how you disaggregate uh, based on the age groups. I'll not spend some time, uh, time on over here because I am afraid of the, of the lady standing with the card here. Um, but I want to highlight this part, which is, I think, very important to, for you to notice. Um, are we on to the next slide? Um, um, so here on my right, you have this slide, which, to, to, which shows you the, uh, the brain growth periods. Um, you see the preschool years from one to five, which have a highest brain growth. And then you have on the l extreme right side of you, the graph that shows another brain growth spurt that happens in adolescence. And you look at poverty rates on the left in <coughs> Nepal, which is 2014, I'm sure it has changed. But you look at the highest poverty rates, which are from zero to nine and 10 to 17. And these are the age groups when you're actually having the highest brain growth, re brain growth re period. If you actually superimpose budget investments on these two graphs, you will in fact see that you actually have the lowest budget investments in these two age groups. And this is true for most of South Asian countries. And that's where I say we are losing the opportunity to change South Asia if we are not really investing in these two age groups. And it is highlighted by the fact that you still have a very high level of poverty in these two age groups. Um, so in, within the household, if you look at um, this study that we have just, uh, we are just uh, in fact in the process of finishing, um, you have uh, a huge amount of gender differential in terms of uh, how children experience poverty in the household. You see the girls experience a higher level of multidimensional poverty even within the same household. This is true for certainly for Pakistan and Afghanistan and India. It is uh, different in, in Bangladesh, but overall South Asia girls are more deprived within the household. The second uh, interesting fact is that within the intra-household inequality, um, you have a uh, percentage of school children who reside in an MPI, MPI poor household um, with one child doesn't go to school and one child actually goes to school. And you see that within the same household, you can, you can actually have children who one of them goes to school and another does not go to school. Similarly, you see a percentage of children from zero to four where at least one child is malnourished and another is not malnourished. So the question is what is really going on within that household? Why is one household, within the household, one child is actually able to go and another child is not going to school? And within the same household, we have a child who is not malnourished and there's a child who is malnourished. We need to understand this better in terms of being able to change policy. Now we also, when we were doing this data, we actually stumbled upon this interesting figure, which is that uh, you have in each of the, each, in these uh, multi-dimensional poor households, a child with a six year schooling and living um, in, a, in, a, in a household where no adult is educated. Now we call these pioneer children, which we believe are a, a really a hope for change at the household level. Um, so if you look at these children living in South Asia, you see India with 14.2% of these children. 29 million children actually are those children living in MPR poor households where none of the adults is educated. And highest number of, in fact, children of this kind are actually in Bangladesh and Nepal. Where, and this, I think, probably reflects higher level of social protection in Nepal. But you have a very high level of children who actually are going and have six years of schooling within an MPA poor household where no adult has educated. So in conclusion, what I would say is that um, if you want to really change budgets, you still need to integrate household level, intra-household level dynamics in terms of uh, understand the household and what is really happening and what, what uh, implications does it have for budget allocation process and how can we actually try and get budget to focus on MPI poor households with differences within the household and try and focus policy on that. I'll stop here. I have the green card, I think. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alim. Now, 
uh, may I request uh, Mr. Stefano Petrodosto. Uh, he will be presenting, talking about uh, promoting equality for the poor and vulnerable in Nepal. Uh, thank you, thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, in some respects, uh, I feel my presentation is uh, easier because coming uh, after the session this morning and, and also after my colleagues now, uh, there is a lot of similarity in messages. So in the interest of time, I'll glide through the slides that I, that, uh, I put together. Um, you have them with you, um, but uh, hopefully I will uh, be um, respectful of the time. So I wanted to start by giving you, whoops, clearly push the wrong button. To give you a, a, a general overview of uh, yet another way to look at uh, inequality across South Asia, we heard from the Honorable Minister of Finance uh, this morning that despite reductions in poverty, inequality does remain uh, a challenge uh, in the region. And um, um, to no surprise, we also have uh, the World Bank, our own index, so uh, you've already <coughs> seen three or four just in the podium today. And uh, without entering into the details, um, because it wouldn't be time to do that. Um, it seems to me, however, there is a certain converse, convergence in messages that is coming across from, from the various presentations, independently of how these things are constructed or, or built. The, the Human Capital Index, which was launched by the World Bank not too long ago, is basically a combination of uh, uh, health, education, and survival rates, and uh, provides, tries, to, tries to provide a measure of future productivity of youngest generation. Um, again, I will not enter into the details. It was, however, presented here in Nepal not too long ago, I believe uh, earlier in the spring. And the message that I want to give you here that um, South Asia, as you can see, is uh, the second lowest um, region in, uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, looking at a different angle and moving, therefore, implicitly more into a multidimensionality of poverty, even uh, uh, as we also heard this morning, even standing as declined in the region, it still remi remains a really uh, substantial issue. And, and you can see the variation both across regions or within region, where you might notice that there is some level of convergence of sorts, but still at uh, very, uh, very high levels. And what this data masks, by the way, and we will get into uh, a, in a minute, is also what is the, actually the variation within country across uh, socioeconomic groups or, or uh, uh, geographic areas. Um, now, looking uh, brief, quickly at education, also the, um, the variation is quite is quite high. Uh, um, you see across across uh, um, um, several regions in, in in some of the sample countries I put on the slides, but um, as well as uh, uh, you know in uh, in uh, rural India or uh, in rural Pakistan. And again, the message that I'm trying to drive at is that. Uh, in a notion of multidimensionality, um, there is still a lot to do in terms of, you know, of uh, these, these uh, dimensions. Now, I would like to touch briefly also on, on, the, um, on, on the working side of, of, of the equation, if you will. For me, uh, you know, so this, disentangling social protection from jobs is, is actually somewhat artificial, so as the two, to some extent, were, were, uh, were together. And the, and the message here is that, you know, in many respects, uh, working conditions are not sufficient to provide uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for households where there is a high prominence still in the region of uh, informal employment. And again, another point that, I, that the Honorable Minister also uh, um, brought, up, uh, brought up this morning. Um, now, particularly for, uh, for younger populations, this is also uh, even, even, even a stronger phenomenon. And you can see in, in one of the graphs uh, on, to the right the difference between new entries and availability of jobs, where there is a substantial gap that particularly in South Asia leads to you know, uh, uh, migration, migration pressures. Again, we don't have time to discuss this today, but uh, this is a very important phenomenon, which in my view has also repercussions uh, on social protection systems because there is now an emphasis, at least in some countries, in looking at safe migration, at least to, again, uh, design systems that are protective of those engaging in migration 
um, and the families that are, that are left behind. We don't have time to discuss this, but uh, it is an important aspect that at least uh, from the World Bank, we're starting to look more and more, but there are, I know there are also other organizations, of course, whereby amongst the many dimensions of uh, migration, there is one also related to uh, social protection uh, systems. Um, one point also that I wanted to stress is, as it was also mentioned earlier, is also the uh, large gender gaps that exist in, uh, in, in the region. And uh, with, with uh, only 30% women working, and as you can see, there is also a relatively high variation uh, um, across, across uh, different countries in, in the regions, but the, but the numbers are quite high. Where you have situations like in India or Pakistan, where only about 30% of women work for each, uh, for each 100 men, uh, not to mention the difference in access and level of wage uh, or, or salary. Now, uh, very quickly, um, what can be done in some sense to promote equality or access to opportunity for the poor and the vulnerable? So let me just focus on a couple of challenges, but there are, there are many, as you can ex um, elaborate from, uh, from what I presented before. Here I'm using, uh, just as a way of example, some information that is perhaps more related to, uh, to Nepal. But, but I wanted to stress uh, the importance of understanding and focusing on the socioeconomic inequality and geographic challenges that limit access to services as well as the disparities that are uh, related to service quality and importantly for the region in general, but also as we heard or earlier for Nepal, the, uh, how the vulnerability to shock can significantly set back achievements in, in human capital uh, accumulation and development, not just for the poor, but also those that are you know, vulnerable to, to this type of shocks. Um, uh, another, another aspect that I wanted to briefly stress, and I alluded to earlier, but I wanted to contextualize it a bit more for, for Nepal, is uh, the challenge for youth unemployment, where the rates are you know, higher than average, as one would expect, and even higher for, uh, for a female. But uh, once again, also the low uh, female labor force classification and uh, one, the high rate of informal um, employment and uh, subsistence food production, which is also uh, quite, quite prevalent. Um, so just to frame the, to conclude and frame a bit perhaps what is going to be discussed, uh, I understand in the, in the remainder of this, of this uh, very interesting conference is what are uh, some of the suggestions that could help tackle this uh, inequality of opportunities. So first, uh, just linking to what I was saying a minute ago, is precisely focus on issues of access and quality, and quality of services, which are highly variable across, across uh, um, economic uh, measurements of poverty, but also in many cases in the region, also in terms of geographic, uh, both access and the ability for, for the states uh, to deliver uh, quality seriously. Uh, secondly, another potential area for, for discussion and for uh, you know, policies that could improve the simulation is to look, uh, as is already happening in some of the countries, and you see it on this table, on uh, promoting economic inclusion and enhanced productivity. Now, there will be a dedicated session for this, so I don't want to spend too much time, but the idea here is that there are different programs that can be tailored to different levels of of uh, along the continuum of household income, and you do have some example across the world on how these programs have been uh, or have been tried to be implemented, trying to tackle the different uh, socioeconomic aspects that different groups of households and people have along the continuum of, of the income distribution. And, and once again, I believe there is a session that will address this in further, in further detail. Um, I'm skipping these slides just not to uh, take too much time. I wanted to reiterate what we already heard this morning, uh, and I don't want to therefore take too much time, is uh, again to strengthen the links b uh, between uh, uh, social protection and the ability for the population to uh, be resilient to shocks and, and, and be adaptive. Once again, this is a fundamental in the, in the region, in Nepal, but, but, uh, but it's again a characteristic that as much as is predominant across the world is particularly significant in the region and does require a certain level of design of social protection systems that are tailored to this type of, of, of phenomena. Um, 
again, um, in the interest of time, let me, sk uh, let me skip the further details. What I want to, to leave you with is actually perhaps with this daunting picture, how now going from the general that we heard already about having an integrated social protection system and therefore moving perhaps from, once again, from programs to system is a really uh, difficult task that touches upon uh, among a host of programs and a host of uh, services in uh, in um, in the public sector then therefore requires uh, time effort and and capacity to to provide these uh, uh, these linkages one point that um, that again was mentioned uh, before is uh, how a social registry and identification is central to, to this type of uh, intervention. And I hope we've spent more time in, uh, in the remainder of the, on the conference to address in further detail how this can be achieved as, in our view, is, uh, once again, the cornerstone to provide efficient and, uh, and uh, reliable systems. I'm going to stop here. I did not touch on budgetary issues, but I'm glad that my colleagues earlier have done that because clearly needs, uh, this has to be placed into a context also of uh, the fiscal space and, and how much is actually currently devoted in the region uh, to, the, to this agenda, which remains uh, an important challenge to face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Petronostro. Uh, we'll now be moving towards the Q&A round. Uh, we've already uh, consumed 15 minutes from our luncheon time. So another 20 to 25 minutes, if you agree, uh, we have to take from our luncheon time. So we'll have a little bit late lunch and fast lunch, you know. <laughs> so the floor is agreed. It's okay? So 20 to 25 minutes uh, uh, we can allocate uh, for uh, Q&A round. Uh, I would like to request the member of uh, you know, uh, distinguished uh, audiences, please frame your questions uh, very specific and address it to the panelist you seek answers from and be very direct. No explanation, no elaboration. Please raise your hand, identify yourself, and ask the questions. Uh, we'll be able to collect uh, six or seven questions, and uh, uh, we'll request the panelists to address the questions. So, floor is yours. Please uh, take your time. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm just wanting to break the ice, and I'm sure there'll be other questions from the floor. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. A very pointed question. What, what is the reason for the mismatch between the levels of poverty in the early years and adolescent, uh, adolescent years? Uh, and the budgetary allocations. What do you think are the main drivers for that? Uh. <laughs> no, no, I think the answer is, is right here in front of you uh, and in front in the demography that you have in the, in the, in the hall. Uh, you don't have people with the lowest amount of investments in this hall actually. Uh, so if you look at poverty figures, highest poverty is actually children from 0 to 9 and 10 to 14. And then you have very old age poverty. And those people are not here. Um, we have the people here who are the most equal perhaps, and perhaps the most powerful in the society. Uh, on this stage, you have a terrible gender imbalance. Uh, I am very thankful to from Maldives to be here. But essentially, the most disempowered people of the society are not even represented here. And we're talking about equality, social justice, um, so that is one reflection that I wanted to actually bring in my presentation, but I can say this now. I think we have a problem with uh, political expression of those who are oppressed and who are unable to really have full representation in how budgets are decided and allocated. And I don't know how to answer that in the sense of issues of political process and the policy process that, is happen that happens in South Asia. I think there is something fundamentally not right about the 
policy process in South Asia. We get good policies at the at the end of which we're not implemented. It is because of the problems in the political in the in the policy process. And I think we need to really focus much more on how do we integrate information into the policy process and make it more representative of those who are not really don't really have a voice. Oh, please. Thank you very much. I've been like really enjoying this discussion from morning itself, uh, quite uh, like you know, knowledgeable and also to see several data and all those things. Um, we have been discussing about inequality and it has like, you know, come at the center in all the discussions, be it um, like, you know, children or any um, services or anything. Um, my uh, concern is, one of the major factors of inequality is also the gender division of labor. And the women who have been like, you know, contributing their lives throughout, and especially in South Asia even more, like in, in unpaid care work, they are out of the scene in many of these schemes and all. We did say like, you know, targeting is the huge challenge and they are the ones who are out. And then again, when we get into this whole cash transfer and then all these contributory, like, you know, social security mechanisms and all, they are the ones who are out again. What is your view around it? Should they get it? If, like, you know, and yes, they should get it, but then how is it possible? Any more? Quite honestly, I, I think it links to, to the point that was just made. I mean, it, it is, uh, let me first state that I, I worked in South Asia only for two years, so I don't pretend to know all the you know, dimensions that lead to this, to this uh, gender um, disparities that, that, you, that you are alluding to. Uh, I can share with you, for example, that having spent a lot of my professional life in, in Africa, I was quite surprised to see uh, what I what uh, anecdotally at least I, I realize is an even deeper problem of, of uh, this type of lack of access or outright uh, discrimination. Um, the only thing that I can say is that while these are, in my view, uh, a combination of cultural, perhaps, or, or even different stages of development that lead to, this, to these patterns, it is only with uh, proactive policies that you can try to address these, these issues. They won't happen uh, by themselves. Um, so there are uh, options for dedicated programs. For example, let me refer to what I was quickly mentioning on terms of productive inclusion uh, as a way to access to uh, better and more productive jobs, even if still in the informal sector. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities if there's political will. To, uh, to actually design it in a way that they can be uh, you know, better targeted and, and therefore try to redress that kind of imbalance. Uh, another issue which, which I have less information out of sheer ignorance is also the way that uh, in terms of access to education and how much there may be decisions at the household level actually that prompt that type of behavior that may actually lead to uh, you know, self-selecting uh, girls, girls out of school. I plead ignorance on the topic, so it's more of a perception. Uh, but if that's the case, then it's more on behavioral changes that need to happen in order to foster that kind of, uh, uh, the kind of change. Uh, so that's my five cents, but I don't know if anyone else has that. Just, just to add uh, one sentence to the, to the previous question, I think in, in addition to the uh, socio-cultural uh, barriers or challenges, I think, I think that the, 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 this, the government could support this by, I mean, if, if you introduce, um, for example, um, affordable elderly care and child care services, that would at least encourage uh, the family structure to, to have more breadwinners and also think in the future with the, with the aging population and the, the labor shortages that will uh, come true, there is, there is a need for everyone to participate in the labor market. Thank you very much for those very
very interesting presentations. I have two, one question and uh, one comment, and I'll be very brief. Uh, when I look at data on social protection for analyzing fiscal space, what is the fiscal space available for such expenditure? The major challenge that I face, and I think that's true for all researchers, is that social protection is not a functional head in, this, in, the, in budget because it's spread across various you know, programs. So when we talk about comparability of expenditure as a percentage of GDP for social protection, are we actually doing a comparison of the same set of expenditures? I think we need to develop a comparable data set for social protection across South Asia region, and then probably can have uh, much more focused understanding of what would be the fiscal space requirement. I'm not saying that everywhere the social protection policy should be the same, but I think a common understanding of expenditures from the budget is very important to understand the issue of fiscal space. That's the comment that I had. And the second issue, second one is a question. When we talk about social protection expenditure in uh, federal setting, and as Mr. Boyk and Ariel was talking about, your expenditure is around 3% plus, but the data at the global level shows 1.5. I think, is it not important for us to look at when we are talking about federal setting, multiple levels of government, and what, what do they spend in various social protection measures. So combine government expenditure in that, where are the spending happening? I think that understanding is very important to, to get an aggregate view again for fiscal space. And then that, the last question is, how does then one talk about assignment? Assignment of function, who does what better in a federal setting? And the, most of the countries in South Asia are federal now. So, so, how do, so, so, uh, so how do you really make it more effective without looking at assignment of these social protection functions across levels of government? Thank you very much. <laughs> Last but not least. Please, yeah. Microphone. Hello. Volunteer, please. I, I just thought I would come in because the issue is very important that Though we understand that investing in children is so important, why is budgetary allocation so low? And why the types of outcomes they're wanting, why that's not happening? I think the answers have been given, but I would just like to add two additional issues here. One is that the political class across South Asia is partially responding to this challenge. But if you look at, say, both health and education, they're responding to the challenge in terms of perhaps expanding access, but not giving sufficient attention to the issue of quality. So what you're having for the poor, you know, schools are coming up, but if you look at the actual learning achievements, it's much lower. So this, I think there's a task to be done here about the political class trying, uh, having to appreciate that quality and access have to be talked in together, not just access and quality comes later. So that's one issue. And the other one is the, I think, the issue of linking up also to the macro sort of political economy. Uh, he affordable healthcare was mentioned. But one of the key drivers of, you know, the access barrier is a high medicine cost. High medicine cost is driven by a political economy where pharmaceuticals have a very high uh, influence over the policy making process. So I think this link between the social protection concerns and the larger macro, so, some of it was mentioned, taxation was mentioned. We have to actually link sectorally in education, in health, etc. The link with the macroeconomic policy propensities have to be taken on board to get the answers and the solutions that we're looking for. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, giving, uh, before giving to the panelists, I have one question, so maybe Anderson uh, will respond. Uh, in what ways uh, 
are you supporting countries to identify the furthest behind? Uh, so please, uh, questions are raised. Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Baikunta will start. And uh, thank you, Pinaki, for the question. Uh, and Although, I mean, the question was not uh, directly targeted to me, but I'll just come to that point also. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, the federal structure now, and when they have the specific assignments, all three tiers of the governments, they have the specific assignments by the con constitutional mandates and all these things. But again, the resource allocation and matching of the resource alloc allocated to the exact functions and exact activities that they carry out and how to report it back, it's, it's a challenge always. And uh, in, in the South Asia, definitely not in, we are, we are quite new to federalism, I mean the federalism, but uh, reporting back is a bit crucial. Uh, I, I mean, the, going to some years back, when we first started this federal budget in the country, and uh, we provided everything to the local governments in the name of fiscal equalization grants. And many of them, I mean, without spending a penny in some of these activities, which are mandated by the constitution, they probably thought that the federal government will be paying for that one. And then they, I mean, they allocated the resources on their own. I mean, they, for the daily needs that they, they just saw in front of them and all this. So that was the challenge. But now slowly they are also being capacitated and uh, I, I believe that in the days to come uh, the, the actual allocation should be made. But again, the reporting and having the collective data is always a problem. As I mean the Patrick and myself, when we presented the different data over here, Definitely that is the question of, I mean, the, the answer was also given by you yourself. I mean, the social protection, when you see the budget, you see in the budget book, definitely you cannot find the, at the total. I mean, but the sectoral activities are over there, which also have the uh, essence of the uh, social protection issues and all these things. That's what I mentioned about the scholarship and all those things, which you cannot find in the in the social protection budget at the annex of the budget. And so, so this is the problem. And then, if we disaggregate all these data and if we find the raw data, and then I agree with you that I mean, we should be comparing the data in real sense rather than I mean having some some part left. And so, one more <laughs> half a minute to to ask the, I mean the respond to the question of it. If the governments and policymakers always think that it's always need to spend in the children, but again, why the budget is low? I mean, of course, the budget is low in Nepal also, not, not only in the children, I mean, the, for the other, other social activities like, I mean, the education and health, uh, we are still lagging behind at the international norms and so. But uh, we should also be considering about the fiscal space and the resource pie, where, whether we have the enough resource pie to uh, have all this allocation. And nevertheless, I'm not saying that by saying this, I'm not denying that, I mean, we shouldn't be spending in the, in the, in the child protection or children and all this. But again, the fiscal space is there and prioritizing the resources and prioritizing the expenditure is also a crucial one. That's why the National Planning Commission in taking care of this MTEF, which prioritize the expenditure and I, believe in the days to come, they will refine the criteria to address these issues more Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I just want to add one thing on the unpaid work that was, uh, in Maldives what we are doing is to try to incorporate it into the national accounts because a lot of, like these tourism and those uh, small uh, 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 productions that women are engaged in, it's not reflected, but they are actually bringing in income, but that is not reflected in the national accounts. So what we are trying to do is it, it, to, be in, it, to, to get it included so that the women's participation is mo reflected more in the uh, broad spectrum. The other thing is resource allocation. When we talk about um, social protection in the ministry, we do get a huge uh, sum, but it is mainly it mainly goes to the welfare like those um, these cash assistance and th uh, th those areas so the real social protection services that we are providing is not uh, actually uh, enough 
to provide uh, such protection services that we are engaged in. Yes, it is. Um, we there are like resource pool skills uh, skills that can be pulled uh, within the region that we can work together in order to address this more effectively. So I just wanted to highlight those. Um, sure. Very briefly. I just had an observation on the question about the level of expenditures in, uh, in social protection. Um, well, first of all, just to make the situation, at least from my point of view, even worse, the average that we have seen mask uh, a host of programs and activities. For example, uh, in many countries, I, I don't know the numbers for uh, specific South Asia that I can cite, but uh, public pensions absorbs a large majority we said sorry I'm being cut off <laughs> but well, the point that I'm making is that the situation is even worse not only the numbers are low but even within numbers we can argue and we don't have time to argue but we could argue if uh, public pensions are actually progressive or regressive in terms of improving the inequality so it is, however, true, and we are trying to do it in many countries through uh, some detailed analysis of public expenditures to understand, even at a constant budget, what are the ineffects that are in the system given the plethora of programs and activities. Not only about potential overlaps across programs, but also the efficiency in the, in the individual programs. That doesn't detract to the need to increase the share in the budget. saying something um, anyway to make it short I think you, you you all get my point you know of course there is a debate on how to increase the share that is dedicated to certain programs but th there is more that can be done if one looks in further granularity and detail about the again the multiplicity of programs potential overlaps efficiency that can be improved and I'm thinking now of social protection but you can have a much broader conversation also, when we talk about the quality and access of services, which has, in my view, faced the same issues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, addressing the, there were two questions and, and the last one from the chair. I think the, the common understanding of social protection and the spending, um, I think ILO is probably the uh, organization that has tried this mostly. They have the um, World uh, Social Protection Report or something where they do collate the spending by country and uh, well it, in this case and we're using it so we shouldn't blame ASCAP for the wrong number of Nepal there but it's it's obviously if, if you if you have the detailed administrative data it will in most cases not 100% correspond to what has been submitted to uh, to the to the organizations asking for it, it's it's like that. Why I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the fiscal space, I I have a little bit of an issue because when it comes to social protection or social spending, it's always coming back to the fiscal space. If we I, I don't hear those discussions really or read the newspapers when when we're talking about building a bridge or expanding the armed forces. It's less of a fiscal space, space issue in those occasions than, than when we want to invest in people. And I think that, that's a mindset. And we always talk about investing in a bridge and the cost of social protection, right? It's, uh, investing in people is an investment. It's not a cost. It's a long-term investment. And I think that has to, th that's a change of mindset I think we need, we need to, to do. Um, and the, the third question from the chair, thank you for asking that question. Yes, we do help countries to, to, to work with them to identify the forces behind. Um, uh, we have data for a number of countries in Asia Pacific, and said, I think it's like 21, 22 countries. But this is based on the DHS and the mix, and we would be very pleased to work with your governments in terms of using more granular data and, and be able to trickle down or also using you know sub-regional areas within the countries and see where these pockets are for a range of opportunities so please send us an email thank you 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for your very interesting uh, discussions and uh, insights. Uh, I'll not take uh, more than three or four minutes, so please, uh, I would like to salute your patience. We've already took uh, 35 minutes from your luncheon times, so please, more, uh, three or four minutes, and I'll conclude. <laughs> I'll be very brief, yeah. Uh, from the perspective of uh, my organization, National Natural Resources and Fiscal Commission, uh, I was trying to reflect you know, uh, the presentation, the questions uh, raised from uh, floor and responding uh, the issues. Uh, the function of uh, this commission is to uh, advise uh, to the different uh, you know, sphere of the government about the allocation of you know, uh, revenues, uh, intergovernmental fiscal transfer, the ceiling of uh, limit of borrowing, uh, and uh, you know the basis and criteria uh, to improve uh, the revenue collection and uh, uh, to improve the you know uh, expenditure pattern. Uh, from that perspective, we are you know working very hard uh, to find out the. Uh, to bridge the gaps, you know, the horizontal gaps as well as, uh, you know, vertical gaps. The vertical gaps means, you know, uh, the expenditure need and the revenue generating capacity, the difference between the expenditure need of the different spheres of the government and uh, the revenue generating capacity. And the horizontal gaps uh, is, you know, gaps among the uh, municipalities and gaps among the provinces. So uh, to you know, narrow down the gaps, uh, these two gaps, uh, we are trying to uh, design our uh, intergovernmental fiscal transfer uh, framework and revenue sharing uh, framework. But uh, um, Dr. Oral has already uh, mentioned that you know, uh, the fiscal commission is trying to bridge that gaps, but actually what is happening at the household level, what is happening at the program level, what is happening at the local level, at the provincial level, whether they are targeting in the very right way or not. I think uh, this is a very important question uh, we have to look after. So uh, I'm very much uh, interested uh, to know the, you know, uh, the findings uh, from this uh, uh, you know, program. Uh, how can we devise uh, such uh, tools and instruments to make sure that, you know, uh, the definitely the social protection, the framework will be ensured, you know, uh, while planning, uh, budgeting uh, at the local level as well as uh, provincial level. So uh, th that would be the very uh, important uh, takeaway things uh, for the, uh, you know, commission. Uh, I am recalling uh, one very uh, popular saying in this region. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, from this uh, perspective, you know. Uh, give a man a fish and you, uh, you feed him for a day. And teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. But I have a little bit uh, different idea from this, you know. Uh, in this region, the many things we inherit, inherit from our parents. For example, assets, knowledge, skills, we inherit from our parents. So if it is so, if you teach, if you, uh, you know, teach a man, I think uh, it will transfer gener generation to generation, intergenerational transfer uh, is there. So from this uh, perspective, I think we are talking about uh, equity-based, uh, you know, social protection framework, equity-based approach, equality-based approach. We are debating on that, where to trade off. But is it a time to think beyond it? Is there any space? Is there any way out to uproot the root cause of inequalities? What are the root causes of inequalities? So I think uh, it is a very complex phenomenon. This is the, the inequality is the manifestation of power, politics, and structure. 
If it is so, I think uh, we need to think beyond this framework. In the short term, in the immediate term, those who are hungry, those who are highly vulnerable, they need this safety nets. Of course, this is very, very important. But in the long run, is it sufficient to make the just society, to enhance the social justice? From that perspective, I think we have to start uh, the debate and discourse. Uh, oh, red card is already raised. I consumed my time. <laughs> now chair, chair is in trouble, you know. So uh, I have to stop uh, here. Um, thank you so much uh, uh, being with us uh, for your passions. Uh, have a very wonderful day and uh, wonderful uh, lunch. I'm sorry uh, the lunch is a little bit late. Uh, bon appétit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much one more time to all the panelists, the speakers out here, and of course, thank you so much, Mr. Powdale, for chairing the session. With this, now we move to the lunch break, which I believe will be only for 45 minutes. Uh, so I hope to see you all same place uh, after 45 minutes. We have more discussion, more agendas to talk about, more speakers here. So let's be on time and make sure that we incorporate everything that's needed at the given time. Thank you so much.